So let's look at example 1 now. Example 1 says we want to compute the derivatives of functions written as accumulations. So we're going to be applying that fundamental theorem of calculus part 1. If I want to find the derivative of this, I'm going to be taking the derivative of the integral from 3 to x of 1 over t plus 1. Well, that fundamental theorem of calculus says if I have a definite integral with the variable up here, my derivative of it is going to dump that x inside and the integral will disappear. If we look at this next one, we can see that it doesn't quite fit the template. And the reason it doesn't is that I have the x in the wrong place. That x, before we can apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, needs to be on the top. So we're going to use our properties of integrals and rewrite this as the derivative of the opposite of 1 to x. Notice if I switch the order of the integration, then I change the sign of the result. So now when I take the derivative, I will move through that negative coefficient, and then I'll hit the integral, and the derivative of the integral will dump that x inside. For my third example, with the third example, the first thing that I notice is that I have a function of x in that upper limit. So when I take the derivative, I'm going to be thinking about the chain rule because I'll hit the integral first and the fundamental theorem of calculus will tell me to dump that inside, but then I will hit the upper limit and the derivative of that will give me a 2. So if I apply the chain rule, that 2 gets multiplied at the back. If I look at part D, I see that I have functions of x in both the lower limit and the upper limit. So this is like part C, only a little tougher. What we're going to do first is we are going to split the integral so that we can see that we will climb from sine of x to some constant a, and then we'll pick up where we left off at a, and we'll continue on to cosine of x. When we do this, we can now switch the order and get the opposite of a to sine of x times a t squared dt plus the integral from a to cosine of x of t squared. Now it's two of those part c type problems. So if I take the derivative of this, I will move through the coefficient, then I'll hit the integral which dumps that sign down inside the function, and then I hit the sign, which means I'll multiply by a cosine. Then I move through the addition, I hit the integral, that hitting the integral by fundamental theorem of calculus, that cosine of x gets dumped inside, and then I multiply by the derivative of the cosine. So if we want to generalize this, we can see that this would break down to the derivative of a g of x up to a for any constant a, and then we'll pick up again at a, and continue on to h, then we will flip the order here, and then we'll take the derivative using both the chain rule and the fundamental theorem of calculus. Move the derivative through the negative coefficient, hit the integral, g gets dumped inside, hit the g, and you'll multiply by the derivative of g by using the chain rule, then you go through the addition, you hit the integral again, so h gets dumped inside, and then you multiply by the derivative of h. So if we want to write down the pattern that works every time, we can look at what's happened here. It looks like we took that h and dumped it in, and then multiplied by h prime, and then we subtracted the g plugged in times the derivative of that g. And this pattern will work all the time. We'll see that if there's a constant on the bottom, that g prime would turn into a zero. We'll see that if this is just a regular x, we'll just get f of x times 1. So this one pattern will solve all parts a through e for us. If we look at example 2 now, we're going to use part 1 of the fundamental theorem of calculus with L'Hopital's. And I want to compute this limit as x approaches 2. Well, remember with limits, my first line of defense is simply to plug the 2 in. If I do that, I will get the accumulation from 2 to 2, which is 0, over 2 squared minus 4, which is 0. Therefore, we see that it is a candidate for L'Hopital's. That means the limit will equal the limit as x approaches 2 of 
the derivative of the top over the derivative of the bottom. Well, the derivative of the bottom is simply 2x. The derivative of the top, we'll use that FTC part 1 and just simply plug the x in. Now if I take the limit, I'll get e to the 4 over 4. With example 3, we want to be able to find f of x when we know the accumulation. Well, in order to get f of x by itself, I need to get it out of the integral. And I can do that by taking the derivative of both sides. When I do that, on this side, the x will get dumped inside, and I'll have f of x equals. And on the right, I will have 9x squared plus 14x plus sine of x. Notice that I have now found f of x. With example 4, we're given a derivative and a point, and we want to write the original function. That means we want to write an expression for y if dy dx equals the secant of x, and y of negative 1 equals 4. Well, in order to do this, we need to write the antiderivative. We have to be able to answer the question, what did I take the derivative of with respect to x that gave me secant? And if you look at your derivative rules that you have memorized, there's nothing that gives you a secant of x. That's why we need the fundamental theorem of calculus. Turns out that the antiderivative, if you recall, will be the accumulation from a to x of the secant of t. The reason this is an antiderivative is because if I take the derivative, the x will get dumped inside, and I'll be left with the secant of x. So we know this is an antiderivative, and we want the general antiderivative so that we can then nail it down using the one point that we know. So I know that I get a 4 out when I plug a negative 1 in. So if we look at this, we can see that there are two different constants here. And if I choose one, then the other one will be mandated by the equation. So we have to decide what could we choose that would make this really easy to work with. Well, I know that integrals, if the limits are the same, are easy, easy, easy to compute because it's just 0. So if I let a equal negative 1, then that will convert this to 4 equals the accumulation from negative 1 to negative 1 of the secant function plus some constant. Well, this is 0, which means the constant will be 4. So now I can write y for any value of x will be that constant 4 plus the accumulation from negative 1 to x of the secant of t with respect to t. Now you might be wondering why I put the c in front. The reason I did that is all too often people neglect to write the dt. And when they do that, it will look like the integral of secant plus c, and that the whole plus c is inside the integral. To avoid that confusion, we'll just put it in front. Now another thing I want you to notice is the placement of the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate in the final answer. Notice that this was the y-coordinate we started with, and this was the x-coordinate we started with. If you can realize that pattern, then you can skip all of this stuff and just go directly to the answer. Example 5, we want to find tangent lines for functions that are written as integrals and write a linearization. So we need to remember that tangent lines require a point and they require a slope. Well, the point is 4 comma something. So to figure out what goes here, we will plug a 4 into the function. If I plug a 4 in, notice I'm accumulating from 4 to 4, which is 0, so my output will just be 5. The slope will be the derivative of that function evaluated at 4. So if I take the derivative of this, the constant disappears, and the derivative of this will plug the x inside. So that'll be a 12 over an x squared minus 6 with a 4 plugged in. If I evaluate that now, I get 12 over 16 minus 6 is 10, gives me 6 fifths. Now that I have the point and I have the slope, I can write the equation of the line or the linearization as L of x equals the slope times x minus the x-coordinate plus the y-coordinate.
With example 6, we want to analyze functions using the fundamental theorem of calculus, kind of like we did in section 4.3. So the question is, here's this function given to us in a, as an accumulation, and we want to know for what values of x does f attain a minimum. Well, we need to remember that f will have a min whenever f prime equals 0 or undefined, and f prime changes from negative to positive. Provided at the place where f prime is undefined, f is going to be continuous. And we already heard or learned in objective one at the beginning when we were developing this that functions written as integrals are differentiable at every value of x. So let's look at the derivative of this f and find its critical points. If I take this derivative, that means the upper limit is going to be dumped inside. So that will be e of an x squared minus 3x quantity squared times the derivative of that upper limit. We're interested in knowing when this is 0 and when this is undefined. Well, it's never undefined because exponentials never have problems, nor do polynomials, and we're just multiplying those two together. It will be 0 when one of these factors equals 0. Well, exponentials never cross the x-axis, whereas polynomials, or lines, can. In this one, my x equals 3 halves, will generate a 0. That means I can now create a sign chart for f prime, and I can analyze what's happening around that single critical value of 3 halves. If I choose something smaller than 3 halves, say 0, and I plug that in, I'll get e to the 0, which is positive all the time, and I will get a negative 3. After 3 halves, say at 5, this will still be positive because exponentials always have positive outputs, and this one will also be positive. So we can see that our original function f will fall and then rise, therefore f will have a min at x equals 3 halves. Our final example, number 7, is most like what you will encounter on free responses involving the fundamental theorem of calculus. Oftentimes you will be given a graph and then told that a new function is the accumulation of that graph from a specific value of a. In this case we're accumulating from 0 to some random value of x and that accumulation will represent the output on this new function h. So the first thing we want to do is find h of 0. Well h of 0 just means we plug 0 into the function which means we are accumulating nothing and we'll get 0. The next question asks for when h is increasing and we have to justify. So we can write down that h will increase when h prime, which is the derivative of this integral, which dumps the x into f, is positive. So since we have a picture of f, we can see when it is above the x-axis. And we can therefore see that h will increase on the interval from 0 until 6. With part c, we're asked on what intervals h is concave up. And let's recall that h will be concave up when h double prime of x, which is little f prime of x, is greater than 0. So we're looking at a picture of f. We can read f prime off of this picture by looking at the slope. Notice that the slope here is negative, negative, negative. It's negative until we get to 9. And at 9 we flatten up and then we start to increase. So that means h will be concave up on the interval from 9 until 12. And I'm going to close that 12 because we have an obvious positive slope at 12. Whereas we remember we do not include the 0 slopes. The next thing we want to know is whether or not h of 12 is positive or negative. So if we go back to how h was defined, remember it was the accumulation from 0 to x on this little f. Well, if I plug in a 12, I'm going to get the accumulation from 0 to 12. So I'm looking at this accumulation all the way across, and we can see here that this area is larger than this area. So h of 12 will be greater than 0 because the integral from 0 to 6 of little f is greater than the opposite 
of the integral from 6 to 12. We see that the positive accumulation is greater than the opposite of the negative accumulation. For part E, which asks where does H achieve its extreme values, we're going to remember that we are looking on a closed interval from 0 to 12, so we can write down that H has extrema either at endpoints or critical points. The critical points are when H prime, which is the same as F, equals 0 or undefined. And we can see that F is never undefined, but it does equal 0 at 6. So now we can test H of 0, H of 6, and H of 12, and we can compare them. We know H of 0 was 0. That's what we figured out in part A. We know H of 6 is a positive number because we have accumulated this area. We know h of 12 will be the accumulation from 0 to 6, which is that h of 6, plus the accumulation from 6 to 12. Well, that will be h of 6 plus a negative number, which will in turn be less than h of 6, but we also figured out that it's greater than 0. Therefore, the h of 0 is going to be our minimum and our h of 6 will be our max.